For our scripture this morning, we have uh, most of, the, of chapter 26 of Deuteronomy. <clears throat> it should sound familiar. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all of the fruit of the ground which you, ha which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling place for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar, uh, before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried out to the Lord our God, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders, and he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. Since today's reading. The book of Deuteronomy is a collection of Moses' proclamation to the Israelites at the end of his life. In, in Hebrew, Deuteronomy means words. These words read today take the form of a farewell address to Moses' people. In today's passage, Moses speaks the ceremonial words for the annual celebration ritual called the Feast of Weeks, which is described fully in about 10 chapters earlier. Right before they enter the Promised Land, Moses reminds his people that soon when their lives become plentiful and free, they must remember their history in exile, where they were slaves and treated cruelly. They must remember that God saved them and brought them to freedom. And in this remembering, the people must give God their deepest gratitude. And this gratitude is symbolized by the first fruits of the harvest, brought forth in a basket and placed on the altar. The Israelites' reference for God, I mean, reverence for God and their recognition of their dependence on God will from this time on be ritualized in this way, never to be forgotten, never to be taken for granted, the first fruits of what we have. Moses could only take his people so far. You may remember that he didn't make it with them. After his death, they would go on the last leg without him into the promised land. His leadership took his people to the threshold and left them with his final words of wisdom, describing the saving actions of God in their lives. Your ancestors were homeless and lived as aliens in Egypt, where they were treated cruelly. They cried to God and God heard them and brought them out of Egypt into a fertile land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The story of their ancestors would guide the Israelites into the future. Their memory would provoke deep gratitude, humility, a spirit of generosity toward other sojourners. Much is packed 
into today's passage. Though only a paragraph in length, it contains a complete theology. Many years ago, I've told this story before many years ago, but I love it. It just warmed my heart. Jerry, you remember this. You and Carolyn will remember this well. Our theme for a family retreat at La Foray was remembering our ancestors, immigration to America. Many of us looked up information and came prepared to have a little fun with some play acting. On Saturday morning, all 32 of us got on board our cardboard boat, dressed in scarves and boots and aprons and old coats that we picked out of a box right before we started. With our traveling trunks on our laps and our passports in our hands, both of which we had made together the evening before, we traveled from the old world to the new. While we sat on board, several people told the stories of family who had come to America, stories they had heard from parents and grandparents. Who else was there? Jerry Lou, were you? Uh, okay. Um, three people in the group were second generation Americans, having had a parent who immigrated to this country, and others who could trace their ancestry back one, two, three hundred years. As we sat in the boat, we sang songs we had looked up ahead of time from some of these countries. Just before we reached the shore, as we were all straining to catch the first glimpse of the Statue of Liberty welcoming us to our new home, our skipper, Margie, read the following words found on the bronze plaque on, on the Mother of Exiles pedestal. Anybody know it? Give me your tired. Your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, your wretched refuge of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Though this storytelling and play acting was all in fun, it was all it also had the surprising effect of showing reverence for those who had come before us and paved the way for each of our lives. You are an immigrant unless you are Native American solely, aren't you? You are the children of immigrants. It brought to immediate awareness our loved ones who also lived through the suffering and the hope of immigration to this country. This immigration included great hopes and dreams, but it also included poverty and separation from family, the experience of deep prejudice, illness, disorientation, and hard, hard work. It made the immigration issue more intimate and real to all of us. Immigration is not just a polarized hot, bed, hot button political issue in our country today, but one that human beings in all times and places have bravely faced. Pope Francis visited a refugee camp on the Isle of Lesbos off the coast of Greece in December of 1921, last year, last December, to comfort the people and to confront the xenophobia of European countries and their treatment of refugees at the borders. He said, I ask every man and woman, all of us, to overcome the paralysis of fear, the indifference that kills, the cynical disregard that nonchalantly contemns to death those on the fringes. Let us stop ignoring reality, stop constantly shifting responsibility, stop passing off the issue of migration to others as if it mattered to no one and was only a pointless burden to be shouldered by somebody else. And we know those who study it at all or look, you know, the tightness of the, of the European continent, uh, I mean, it's, they are inundated you know, with refugees, and it has been a real issue for them how to stay their own country, how to acclimate. I don't, you don't need me to give you a, a civics lesson. Several years ago, though, Pope Francis, the son of immigrants, responded to the policies of the U.S. in a similar way in their treatment of Mexican refugees at our border. And I, I want to say this again because it was so beautifully put in terms of theology. When it comes to offering compassion for human suffering and welcome for the suffering strangers in our midst, there is an authority that trumps the powers of this world. The Bible makes this clear. 
This authority is grounded in a spiritual force of love greater than these powers. Remember this and welcome the stranger with open arms. This is what Moses directed the Israelites to do, together with the Levites and the aliens who res reside among you, you shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. We all know that something is amiss in our relationship to God. If our experience of suffering in all many, in so many ways, not just in the ways the immigrants suffer, but in we we rec we respond to and know what loneliness feels like, what disconnection to life around us, what homelessness, uh, just uh, the sense of unfamiliarity and not knowing how to make your way in certain contexts, the marginalization of others, the banishment of others. If, if we are not sensitized by our own suffering, we can't really feel that. If we can't feel the pain of another. Now, this doesn't mean that the issue isn't complicated. As I talked about a minute ago, it is very complicated. It always has been complicated, the issue of immigration. But as Christians, we must struggle with it. Imagine no longer having a home or a country. Imagine that you must stay on the move wandering with no safe place to retreat or to put down roots, no promise of an end to your displacement, no hope for a return to familiar places, customs, language, people, a place where you were known and where you felt like yourself. In a June 2021 article in the World Economic Forum, the UN Secretary General said this, by the end of 2020, the number of people forcibly displaced due to persecution, conflict, violence, human rights violations, and events seriously disturbing public order had grown to, can you take a guess? Some of you might know. It's 20,000 larger than it was last time I looked. 82, I mean 22 million. It's 82.4 million. The highest number on record according to available data. Just five countries produce 68% of refugees displaced abroad. The Syrian Arab Republic, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. There are many quotable lines in today's passage from Deuteronomy, but probably the most quotable is this, a wandering Aramean was my ancestor. Some translations say a wandering Aramea was my father or my parent. Interestingly, though, a, James, a Jameson Fawcett Brown Bible commentary translates the phrase like this. A Syrian ready to perish was my father or a wandering Syrian was my father. The commentary goes on to describe that the ancestors of the Hebrews were no mad shepherds, either Syrians by birth as Abraham or by long residence as Jacob. Did you know that? I'd forgotten that. When they were established as a nation in the possession of the promised land, they were indebted to God's unmerited goodness for their distinguished privileges and in token of gratitude, they brought the basket of fruits. That's just a symbol of what they need to remember. Well, I thought I'd go back and look at Syria about now. And please, afterward, fill me in, folks, because uh, I would like to know more about what you know. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, even today, their descendants, 11 years after the brutal civil war, which began in March 2011, which killed hundreds of thousands of Syrians, including thousands of children, more than half the 22 million people living in Syria in 2011 have been forced from their homes. Six million are now in other countries. 70% of those still living in Syria exist in poverty, in a country reduced to rubble, still suffering under brutal leadership. Moses asked the Israelites to remember that they were wanderers. These words from the Bible ask all of us to remember and in remembering to welcome the stranger, to welcome the stranger. 
to the first fruits of the harvest, to share in what only God has provided or can provide. Memory which fosters humility. Don't ever forget who, what you came from when you make it big and you're all, you're all decked out and got the right car. Which awakens compassion, which encourages generosity. These are the only things that make sense on our shared path of life. Only compassion will make life worth living, will bring deep peace to the human heart, will bring gladness to the heart of God. And any possible reconciliation of peoples and nations in this world. So, curiously, I decided, we, we knew we had to streamline because Patty was gone today, and now we found out we had to really had to streamline, we didn't have our organist, but I had thought, the lyrics to the powerfully melancholic folk song written well over a hundred years ago and sung so beautifully by so many people. I am a poor wayfaring stranger. So I decided to include those lyrics and I learned when I got in here and Sue was practicing that that's what she was going to play on the flute at, when, at the end of the service. I am a poor wayfaring stranger. I'm traveling through this world of woe. Yet there's no sickness, toil, or danger in that bright land to where, I, to where I go. I know dark clouds will gather round me. I know my way is rough and steep. But golden fields lie just before me, where God's redeemed shall ever speak. Amen.